Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Y'all know this is just a bad April Fool's joke. I got a wig on, right? I tease. Welcome to worship. Uh, we're grateful to have you here. As we begin, we have a few announcements. First, to our guests, thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you are a first-time guest and you're wanting to connect with us, learn more about the church, and uh, maybe just see what it means to be a Christ follower here, then I invite you to text our number um, there, 308-730-4040, and just start the conversation. It's really uh, helpful for us, and I think we try to be as helpful as we can to you there as well. Um, and similarly, you can use that number to uh, share your prayer requests if you'd like. That's for all of us. Um, and there's also a connect form in the back to do either prayers or, or what have you. That's, that's there for you all. So thank you uh, for that. It is a big week for the church, not just because I got a haircut, I promise. <laughs> Um, but it is Palm Sunday today, and so we end our series on Anxious for Nothing, but we also begin Holy Week, and so it's kind of a both-and incredible celebration. There's a lot happening in worship today, um, and with that is the mark, the beginning of Holy Week, a time, a week where we step aside to really just follow the steps of Jesus in his final week before he went to the cross and before uh, the resurrection, which is what we celebrate on Easter. And so we have a few additional worship services. One of those is Monday, Thursday. Not Monday, Thursday, but Monday, which translates to this commandment I give you to love one another. It's a powerful service, and I hope you'll join us for that in person, especially uh, since it's a communion service. There will be communion there, just like there will be later in our worship today. Um, but uh, we'll also stream that online if you're not able to make that. That's this Thursday at 7 p.m. And then on Friday, Good Friday, uh, we remember Jesus' final moments and final breath that he took on the cross with a Good Friday worship service at noon. Again, that'll be here in the sanctuary. We'll live stream it, but we'll be done about 12.30 uh, because we're gonna sit and have lunch together in Fellowship Hall. So if you're uh, around and available, we'd love to we'd love for you to have lunch with us as well that day. And then of course, Easter worship, that's all our regular worship times, so no need to memorize an additional schedule or anything, we're just gonna come, we're gonna worship, we're gonna do what we do, and it's gonna be a powerful, powerful weekend. And so with that, that's our additional worship services. Our rest of our announcements actually have to deal with Kids First Preschool, our, our preschool down at the uh, north end of the building. There's several opportunities to support them. One of those is coming up in May, which is a long way off, but our Kids First Preschool is able to work with North Platte Giving Day, um, which is May 3rd, and we're going to use that for our May mission offering. More details will be on that later, but this week, if you like Runza, I mean, I, I haven't met a Nebraska person that doesn't like Runza, so um, if you dine out on Tuesday with one of our flyers that we have in the back, um, give that to them when you make your purchase, and uh, they'll give about 15% of those proceeds to our preschool, which is pretty cool, and and then, of course, it's plant season, and so they do their annual plant sale about this time as well. All sorts of opportunities. Choose one, choose all three, whatever works best for you. Thank you for supporting that ministry. There's one other thing that I wanted to lift up, though, with Kids First Preschool, another way to support that's entirely different than these fundraisers. And, one of the, and, it, and it has to deal with our leadership need. We, right now, have a vacancy in our director position. And so um, that, there's two ways for you to support us in that. One, would you be praying for the right person to fill that position? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a unique position because they need to be highly qualified in certain areas, but it's also part-time. So um, we're really looking for the right person with the right schedule um, that, that just fits that. So if you would, pray for our preschool and, and our leadership there as we find our next director. And then two, one, the other way that's really easy, if you know somebody who would be interested or that might fit this, um, just invite them to have a conversation with Pastor Mike. He's pretty easygoing. I mean, I work with the guy. So uh, anyway, just uh, encourage them to reach out, ask some questions, and uh, maybe we could find the right fit that way. You may know the next director, and, not know, and we might not know it yet. So thank you for your help in that way. It is a wonderful day to celebrate. It is Palm Sunday. And so we're going to begin our worship now with our call to celebration. It's a responsive reading. It's on the screens. Will you stand and join your voice with Pastor Mike? 
Well, we are so excited with all the ways that we get to worship today, but as we talk about this topic of peace, I wanted to start with this scripture from Romans 12. I invite you to follow along in this responsive reading on the screen. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Live in harmony with one another. So far as it depends on you, do not be overcome by evil. Amen. Our opening song today is Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, and our kiddos will have their parade of palms during this song as well. sing the first verse one more time tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear things I would ask him to tell me if he were here scenes by the wayside tales of the sea stories seated.
Amen. Awesome, awesome. If there's any other kiddos that want to come up for children's time, you are welcome to do so right now. We are so glad that you're all here. You guys having a good day? You guys were so loud just a minute ago. You guys having a good day? Yeah. All right. We're safe. So today you guys did a parade of palms. That's pretty cool. Do you guys like to go to parades? Yeah. What's the best part about going to a parade? Getting candy. Getting candy. Anything else? Getting free stuff. Free stuff? What's, what's your favorite thing to see in a parade? Candy. candy. We really like the candy. Goodness. You get toys. Yeah. The big balloons. Yeah, balloons are kind of fun as well. Those are awesome. So... Balloons that have candy in them, it would be perfect, right? We'd have everything all in one. Yeah, there's lots of things. And a parade has lots of different things in it, right? You'll have floats, and you'll have fire trucks, and maybe tractors, and horses, and it's awesome. There are all these different things. Well, today is Palm Sunday, and we're celebrating a parade that Jesus was in. So how many, what all do you think was in the parade with Jesus? Do you think there were fire trucks in the parade? No. Do you think, hmm, were there any floats in the parade? No. no. Well, Jesus must have had all these bags of candy, right? He was throwing out candy everywhere. Is that what was happening? No. There was no candy either? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, Jesus, he, he came riding in on an elephant, right? No. On a donkey. No. On a donkey? Are you sure? I'm being silly. That, that could be. So Jesus came riding in on a donkey. He could have ridden in on an elephant, I guess. Or he could have ridden in on uh, a camel. I tried to ride a camel once. It wasn't very easy to do. Or he could have ridden in on a horse because they had lots of horses then. But why do you think Jesus chose a donkey? Because, because it's a sign of peace. Because it's a sign of peace. The donkey isn't about war, it's not about battle or power, it is a symbol of peace that we have as well. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's sermon, how Jesus gives us peace as well. So as we have our sermon, I want you guys to be listening for all the times we talk about peace today, okay? Can we have a quick prayer? Would you guys fold your hands and repeat after me? Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your sacrifice and teaching us peace. Help us, God, to celebrate you in every moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Thank you all so much. You can take your palm branch with you or leave it here, and you guys can have three suckers, one for you and two to give away. Well, we are so blessed to have an incredible children's ministry as well. I think we had about 45 kids show up Wednesday night for ministry, uh, preschool through fifth grade, and it's incredible to see all of their smiling faces and the joy that they have as well. This has been a busy week in planning for the church. Of course, we've got all the Holy Week pieces coming up, so there's lots of planning that goes with that. We're already planning our year-end parties for our kids' ministry and our student ministry. We're even planning uh, confirmation for next fall and looking ahead into 2024 for a special trip we'd like to take with some of our college students. There's always more that we're looking at doing, ways that we are truly investing in this mission statement we have to, to leave a spiritual legacy for the next generation. But there was one moment this week that was really impactful for me. Uh, we had confirmation just last weekend and had four new students join uh, the life of the church. But after worship, I had a teenager come up to me and say, Pastor Mike, I never had the chance to do confirmation is there a way I can do that with you? 
And I looked at that and I went, a, a lot of kids would say, my parents made me go to confirmation, right? But she saw something in these four students and in the faith that they showed and in them claiming and saying, this is my faith. And this high school student said, I want what they have. That's the gift of the church. It's the investment we make in this next generation. You know, when we talk about investing in them, there are so many ways that we do that. With our prayers, with our presence, in the ministries that we offer, in the classes that we have, but also in the way we give back to the life of the church. So if God puts it on your heart this week to invest in that ministry in that way, we would love for you to share your tithes and your offerings with us and this investment in the next generation as well. Our offering plates are in the back. You can always give online. You can mail a check to us or drop it off at the office. But however you feel led to give to the ministry of this church, know that it is, it is this sense of importance we put on the next generation and how we are investing in them so that they can be Christ followers for generations to come. Well, as we continue in our worship, we take a moment to pray, and, uh, and so I invite you, join me now in a posture of prayer, and let's go to the Lord. Well, Jesus, today we, we are inspired by the sound of children's voices in worship. We are glad to see familiar faces, or even excited to see a haircut. Jesus, we are just glad to be here in your house of worship. For whatever reason, you've brought us here today. And with that comes a desire to glorify you, to seek you, and to, and to take in the wonder that you are. Christ Jesus, today as we come to you and as we begin to contemplate the moments of your life, your death, and your resurrection, we humble ourselves now. We recognize there is a brokenness in the world. There's a brokenness inside each and every one of us. It leads to anger. It leads to outburst. It leads to distancing and separation. And yet, Jesus, the brokenness doesn't even seem to stop there. This world is so broken. There are many of us who deal with with cancer, with health issues, with additional surgeries. And Jesus, we thank you when you hear our prayers. We thank you when those things seem to miraculously heal. But Jesus, some of us are still caught up in the need of that healing. Some of us need relational healing. Some of us need something to go right in our nation. Yes, Jesus, even at that level, there's brokenness represented all over. And it worries us and it concerns us. And we don't even know the half of it. So Jesus, today, as you hear our rejoicing, hear our longing for you, hear, hear our longing for your healing. Hear the prayer of each and every one of our hearts because we trust you and we know that you will provide just as the way you are providing and bringing us together as a church. Jesus, hear that faithfulness, hear that trust as we continue to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our worship. We're going to sing, I've Got the Joy. It's not in your hymnal, but it is on the screens. You'll know the tune. It's pretty similar to the one the kids just sang. And so just lean on that for your ear, and uh, we'll continue our praise. Will you stand and sing?
It's like a river, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain.
I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all the things I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to the, as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So how many decisions do you think you make in the course of a day? I know that kind of sounds like an impossible question, right? But the reality is you all made a decision as soon as I asked that question. Some of you were trying to come up with a literal answer, and the rest of you are going, yeah, right, I'm not even going to try that, okay? And so you made a decision right in that moment. We make thousands of little decisions throughout the day, and usually without much thought. In 2018, a research project determined that the average uh, adult makes roughly 35,000 decisions every day, which sounds excessive to me, right? That's a, that's a decision every two and a half seconds. And so I made the decision to not fully trust their research, I guess, right? Whatever the real number is, most decisions don't overwhelm us. We make the choices without even thinking about it. We made the choice this morning whether we were going to turn the alarm off and get up or hit the snooze button one more time. We made a decision whether we were going to have pancakes or eggs or cereal for breakfast. You made the decision to come to worship. That was a good choice, by the way. I know there are a couple teenagers in the back that are thinking to themselves right now, well, I didn't have a choice in that. But you chose not to argue with your parents, which was a good choice as well, right? Most decisions are so small, we, we don't even think about them. We make those choices without thinking about it. But there are some decisions, some choices that we make that push us into this place of panic stops us dead in our tracks. And if you can relate to that comment, congratulations, you're a card-carrying member of the Warriors Club, right? Today, we're wrapping up our series called Anxious for Nothing. And for six weeks, we've been looking at this whole idea, focusing on Philippians 4. It's an incredible passage that I've encouraged people to, to memorize. Verse 6 is where we get that anxious for nothing idea. But verse 7 is really where I want to focus our attention today. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know the word peace appears more than 300 times in Scripture? And often when we hear the word peace, we, we think an absence of conflict, right? The end of a war. Maybe we think about getting along with our friends or our family or our coworkers. But the thing is, peace isn't just situational. Peace is a choice that we make. So today we're going to talk about how we can pick peace. Now, the focus scripture for this entire series comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we've talked a lot about the, the format of where that came from. How 
Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell, most likely just days or weeks before his own death. But the reality is we, we don't know for sure about his ending. See, Scripture tells us about Paul's life and about his ministry, but we really don't know what happened at the end. And I think in reality, that's exactly how Paul would have wanted it. He spent his life trying to make people see Christ and not him. But the scripture we heard today that Miles read for us actually comes from the Gospel of John. It's part of what Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, just hours before his arrest and death. And I find this this beauty and this challenge that both the Messiah and Paul, who's arguably the greatest of the apostles, both talked about peace right before their own death. See, it's not about the circumstance. Peace is a choice relationally and emotionally. See, in today's scripture, the disciples are distressed because Jesus keeps talking about how he's leaving, and they just don't understand. Jesus is telling them, this has to happen so that the Holy Spirit can come, but, but they don't quite get it. And he promises them that, that he's not going to leave them alone. Verse 27 reads, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. It was meant to comfort them, but they still didn't get it. And in reality, maybe, maybe we don't either. See, so often we feel alone or abandoned. Like God is silent in the midst of our struggles. Now, the reality is, when we face this chaos, it, it's really a place where maybe the Holy Spirit can show up in the fertile grounds. So often, we, we don't understand what God is really doing. We don't see how the challenges and struggles could ever lead to anything good. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that God causes us to struggle. But I do think God uses the struggles we face. It's in our weakness that we truly understand Christ's strength. Theology professor Elizabeth Johnson writes, It is only with time and prayer and the aid of the Holy Spirit we begin to see how God might be working for good, even in the midst of terrible and confusing events. You know, sometimes I think we misunderstand the Holy Spirit. That's not true. I, I know we misunderstand the Holy Spirit, right? Years ago, Francis Chan wrote a book called Forgotten God, and the premise of the whole thing is how the modern church today misunderstands and even neglects this third piece of the Holy Trinity. Too often we, we relegate the Holy Spirit just to Pentecost or, or just to speaking in tongues. And we forget that that same Holy Spirit is where we get the peace of God. One of my favorite stories of Jesus after the resurrection comes in John 20. Jesus appears in this locked upper room to his disciples, and, and he tells them, peace be with you. And then he breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. I love that picture because as much as we like this bold and, and powerful Holy Spirit that can cause us to do incredible things, more often in my life it's that that calm and that peace that I need most of all. See, in several translations of today's text, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter instead of the Advocate. 
And in his book, Chan talks about how we miss the Holy Spirit when we're always seeking a life of ease and comfort. He writes, why would we need to experience the comforter if our lives are already comfortable? Now, I don't think that means we, we seek out struggles, but when struggles inevitably come, are we relying on the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul did. And that's what Paul challenges us to do as well. We read this, this statement, be anxious for nothing, and we go, how in the world could you accomplish that? And Paul follows it up with the answer, right? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't always do that. In our anxiety, in our worry, we often become paralyzed. We just can't make a decision. See, when we're constantly in fear that we might make the wrong choice, we make no choice at all. We end up stuck and obsessing over what to do next. And the longer we worry, the more we stress out. We come down with a terrible case of decidophobia. Now, I know it sounds like I just made that word up, but I promise to you, I did not. And it was actually Princeton University philosopher Walker Kaufman who coined this term. But the definition is exactly what you would expect it to be. Decidophobia is the irrational fear of making a decision. See, some of us suffer from it, and we didn't even know it had a name, right? I gotta confess, I, I struggle with this one a lot, especially when it comes to the church. Poor Micah has been waiting for over a month for me to give him the last pieces of our next sermon series all in. I've been pulling my hair out. <laughs> That's commitment to a joke, right? <laughs> But it's not that I didn't have any ideas. It's, it's not that I haven't had time to work on it. As a matter of fact, the struggle has become I had too much stuff and I couldn't narrow it down. See, I used to be a lectionary preacher and I'm discovering more and more the reason I like that is because the lectionary narrows it down and says, here's four scriptures to pick from this week. And I can make a decision if there's just four choices. But when I can preach on anything in the Bible... I start to feel overwhelmed. <laughs> and it's not that I'm afraid I'm going to make the wrong decision, as though there's scriptures that aren't worth preaching on. It's that I want to make the perfect decision because it matters so much. And the same thing happens when I start preparing for my sermon. Every week I sit down and I do the research and I read the commentaries. I find all of these supporting scriptures and some quotes that I'd like to use. And then I stare at my computer screen and go, I have no clue where to start. There are so many choices, so many directions. I find myself paralyzed for a moment on what to do next. And once I make a decision, once I start, it usually comes together very well, but I just can't make that first step. Maybe some of you can relate, not with sermon prep, but with life in general. In those times where stress and strain and anxiety overwhelms us and we feel like we just can't move forward. We're so scared to make a choice, we don't make any choice at all. Life Church pastor Craig Rochelle calls it the paradox of choices. We tend to think if we have more options, it's going to be easier. But that's simply not true. Deciding what to watch on TV is a great example of this, right? Now, some of you can remember when we only had four channels, and it was easy to pick because you only had four choices. 
Today, we're stuck in this endless loop of scrolling through Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and Roku, and there are just so many choices, we don't know what to do. <laughs> in 2016, Ericsson Consumer Lab found that the average American was spending 23 minutes every day trying to decide what they want to watch on TV. <laughs> Almost a half an hour just to make the decision. The thing is, it's not just with TV. We can fall into that trap with everything. We build up in our brain that, that if we make the wrong choice, everything is going to fall apart. We make every decision the decision that has to be made. Now, during the pandemic, we all know that anxiety levels went through the roof, right? But they actually researched what the reasons were behind it. It was kind of obvious to most of us, but they researched it. And what they found is part of the reason is because every decision became a big decision. During the pandemic, if you were going to shake someone's hand or go to the grocery store, that became a big decision. <laughs> we used to just do it without thinking about it, and now... There was this stress and strain. The thing is, we, we don't need a pandemic for that to be true in our lives. The weight of making decisions sometimes overwhelms us. I couldn't find the original quote anywhere, but maybe you've seen it as a meme on Facebook or a piece of home decor, and I love it. It says, if you think you've blown God's plans for your life, Rest in this. You, my friend, are not that powerful. And don't mishear me. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should just flip a coin for every choice in our lives. Although I did find out this week that's how one of our teenagers decides if he's going to youth group or not. Just flips a coin every Sunday evening. But there is... But there is this reality that maybe every decision doesn't have to paralyze us. Here's an example for you. I think one of the most important decisions we may ever make in our lives is who we decide to marry. It's an important decision, but that doesn't mean that we have to go out and meet every single person who we could possibly marry before we make a decision. Instead, we, we choose someone who fits with us, and we commit to that choice. We decide that we are going to make this work, and that changes everything. So let me get practical for just a moment as we wrap up here. Here are three different nuggets to help you so you don't get overwhelmed in choices. Number one, find a wingman. I'm not talking about dating here, right? Find a wingman, someone who can help you. Our, our fighter pilots actually have this issue where when they would fly by themselves, they would get so overwhelmed worrying about what's behind them and below them and above them that they would actually lose focus on their mission. And our military discovered that if we sent them out in groups with wingmen, their focus was better. Their anxiety was lower because someone else was helping them see things they couldn't themselves. We need the same thing. We need to find trusted people who can help us see things from a new perspective. Proverbs 15, 18 says, An intelligent mind acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Find a wingman. Number two is narrow your choices. If you're overwhelmed with all the choices out there, I encourage you to pick three or four. If it works for a pastor in picking a sermon, it works in your life as well. The thing is, we don't need a hundred choices. More isn't always better. So often, if we really think about it and we say, okay, let's, let's just pick the top three, that gives us a narrow enough window that we can answer the question. 
Matthew 6, 34 says, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is part of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, and and part of what he's trying to get across here is saying, don't try to consider everything. Don't try to see everything that may happen. Focus on this moment, and you'll be able to move forward better. We don't have to see it all in order to move forward. Three, and, and maybe the most important, is pick peace. See, peace is a choice that we can make. Author Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, nobody can bring you peace but yourself. Now, I know he's famous. I know he wrote a lot of great things, but he was off a little bit in this one, in my opinion, right? See, the issue is that we are not the source of our peace. Christ is but we can choose to lean on the one who gives us strength. Paul got that. Paul believed that with every fiber of his being. Paul leaned on that knowledge when everything seemed to be falling apart. Philippians 1.19, he wrote, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my salvation. From a prison cell. Certain he's about to die. He says, it's all going to work out. <laughs> because of Christ. Church, we... We can trust in that same promise. We can trust in that same hope, that same Holy Spirit that Paul did. No matter what you're facing, no matter how overwhelmed you might feel, we can choose peace. We can follow Paul's example, and little by little, we can start to live a life where we are anxious for nothing. Amen? Would you pray with me? Holy God, we are so thankful for what you have done. We are so thankful for the gift of this Holy Week and and the sacrifice that you have made. We are so thankful, God, for the empty tomb that tells us you have defeated even death. But God, we know that there are moments in our lives where, where we feel overwhelmed, where the weight of decisions seems, seems to snowball and we just can't move forward. So God, in those moments, help us to lean on you, to trust what you have called us to do and to be. God, as we come to this this gift of communion, as we approach this incredible table of remembrance, we ask you, God, to, to pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, on these gifts of bread and juice. We ask you to make them be the body and blood of Christ so that we can be Christ for the world, redeemed by your great love. By your spirit, God, make us, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until we all feast at your heavenly banquet where we all see your final victory. We ask all of this, God, through the name of your Son, Jesus, who with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, we give all honor and glory to you, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Well, church, we we have this gift of communion. 
a gift that so often we don't fully understand, we don't fully commit to. But on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered with his friends knowing, knowing what was to come, knowing what he would have to go through. And he took the meal that they all thought they understood as Passover, and, and he changed it. And he, he said, this, this is my body, broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, Jesus took a cup. So common, so ordinary, something they, they thought they knew and understood, and And he took it and he lifted it up to heaven. He gave thanks to God for all who would come before, for all who would come after, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So in recognition of Christ's mighty acts, we come here to recognize, to remember, to embrace the gift of God's presence, to know the promise still holds true, I am with you, and my peace I give to you. I'm going to invite those that are helping serve to come forward at this time. As we continue, I have a few words of instruction for those of us gathered here, obviously those of you online. uh, We just want you to join us in spirit and in prayer. During the course of communion here, we'll have some hymns that will be on the screen, and Nita will lead us in, and I invite you to sing along in that sense of praise and worship. Our welcome team will invite you to come down the center aisle, and they'll just kind of dismiss us as we go, and there will be two stations either on either side here of the table. Place your hand in the kind of shape of a cross here to indicate that you're ready to receive the bread, and then you'll take that piece of bread and dip it lightly in the cup. Um, We'll return either way, but that takes you by the way of the kneelers. If you'd like to kneel and pray, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, Also, there's a gluten-free option here for those that need it, and if you need served in your seat, um, please indicate to the welcome team, and they'll signal one of the stations to come to you after we've served everyone else. And so the last, invita- the last instruction, probably the most important one, is we believe this is God's table. This is Christ's sacrifice, not ours. And so we don't think you have to be a member of this church or any church in order to receive. We just ask that you have that love of Jesus, that desire to glow- grow closer to him and, uh, and receive that. So I think we're ready. Let us continue in our worship. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Jesus, bless, Redeemer, and from the heart God hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God there is a place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God a place where we our savior meet near to the heart of god oh jesus bless redeemer sent from the heart of god hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of god there is a place of full release near to the 
heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be with God our Creator. Children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it be Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
I'm going to invite our acolytes forward. Let's sing that refrain one more time. This is my story. Will you stand? This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Well, church, we have come and we have heard the voice of God. We have been fed by his amazing meal. And now we get to go out in the world and share it with others. It's a busy week. We've got extra services that you can come to. We've got information in the back about how you can support kids first. We've got the offering plates and ways that you can connect and give. But most importantly, you get to carry this peace out into a chaotic world. Go from this place, trusting and knowing that the peace of Christ can shine through us. And that, that helps change the world because Christ is alive. And that is so amazing. Thanks for worshiping today.